Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We know that it is O&D. We know that it is possibly inventory day for some of you. So we really appreciate you taking the time to tune in or to you know watch this webinar after the fact. Um, so as Laura spoke about today, we're talking all things Coravin. And you know she nodded to Coravin's game-changing Coravin Sparkling, um, which was released just a few weeks ago, I think. But let's be honest, Coravin has been a game-changer since it really came onto the market less than a decade ago. So we're really excited to speak about um, Coravin, how they've revolutionized the way that we think about enjoying wine and have allowed us to pour and drink wine without ever removing the cork, which who would have thought we could do that a decade ago? Um, but Corvin has really evolved beyond at-home consumption over the past decade, um, and it's committed itself to being a real resource and partner to beverage and hospitality trade professionals across all three tiers of the beverage industry. Um, so today we're going to talk, discuss some strategies for maximizing pours per bottle, eliminating waste, and ultimately boosting the bottom line, something that we know is more top of mind than ever these days. Um, so to do that, we are joined by three industry leaders who all have experience maximizing profitability in the beverage space. We have Greg Lambrecht, who is the founder and chairman chairman of Coravin. Um, hi, Greg. Thanks for being here today. Um, we have Daniel Jonas, who is our who's the founder of La Polay and La Fête du Champagne, which is coming up again very soon. Um, and he's the beverage director of of Danielle Baloud Restaurant. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. And then we have Gabe Clary, who is the Vice President and Portfolio Manager for Champagne, Germany, and Austria for Skernick Wines. So thank you, gentlemen, so much for being here today. Excellent. Um, so we're going to start off today. We're going to chat with Greg a little bit about Coravin, about the genesis of Coravin. And Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how Coravin has evolved over the past decade? Yeah, I guess I come at the wine industry um, from the wine lover's perspective. Uh, never worked in, in wine, never worked in a restaurant. Um, I work in medicine now and I have since 1993. Maybe 92 was my first invention. I've always been an inventor and an entrepreneur, always developing new medical therapies, either for a big company or um, more recently for my own companies. Uh, so I, I've loved uh, trying to solve unmet needs and they happen to be in the medical space until they became my own. Um, I, was, I fell in love with wine probably when I was 16 years old. I, I went up to Napa Valley and looked older than I was. And so uh, stuck my way into a wonderful winery and they served me my first glass and uh, I really never looked back. I've loved it ever since. And one of the things that I loved was the variety uh, that you can get Cabernet from uh, Western Australia. You can get it from Napa. You can get it from Washington state. You can get great Bordeaux. I wanted to be able to learn and taste uh, as much as possible, but my consumption was constrained by the volume of sale. I would buy a bottle of wine and in order to be able to find out what the wine tasted like on the other side of that cork, I had to remove it. And that started a clock um, for when I had to drink the rest of that wine. And so I was working really hard, uh, as I still do, and um, really drinking a full bottle of wine didn't make much sense. My spouse at the time, she didn't drink much wine. Uh, and then we, when we did drink wine together, we rarely agreed on, on what to open. So uh, there were, so I, I had this desire for variety and then I had this desire to be able to serve her what she wanted, what I wanted when they weren't the same thing. And then friends would come over and they would ask what's open uh, as if like, that's all you get, <laughs> whatever it is that we had yesterday uh, that was still in the fridge. Um, I wanted to be able to explore faster. And so luckily I developed a uh, needle-based chemotherapy delivery system as one of the first products that I'd ever developed in, in medicine. I've gotten really good at making needles that went in and out of things without doing damage to them. So uh, I remember sitting in my kitchen, holding one of those needles in my hand and a bottle of wine going, there's just got to be a way I can <laughs> use this to get wine out of that. Now, I wasn't the first in the medical field to try this, but luckily I'm also a physicist. And so, uh, I knew that if you tried to suck wine out, it would create a vacuum. And so I realized I had to push the wine out. And so uh, tested all sorts of different gases. And uh, I, I tried nitrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, and argon, luckily. Um, interesting story about how I 
found the source of these argon capsules, but uh, they wound up being the best. Argon doesn't dissolve in a liquid. Uh, it's an inert gas, one of the noble gases. And so uh, if you push the wine out of the bottle using argon, air doesn't get in while you're pouring. If the cork is elastic and reseals, um, then you don't have to worry about air getting in after you've accessed. And so I've done now blind tastings out more than a decade uh, with some of the wines that I've poured. And I think one of the oldest ones is in these wine fridges behind me. Uh, oh, bottle, cool. Yeah, a bottle of Costestinel, which I, I just tasted because we moved offices and we were celebrating and we found this bottle. <laughs> and uh, it was out 14 or 15 years since my Very first, cool. longer maybe, 18 years. 2003. Yeah, long time. So yeah, that was the beginning of it. And I remember thinking it had relevance for the home. Um, I, you know, people wanted to drink the way I drank. I, I have a glass of white, glass of red and a dessert wine on a Tuesday. And my spouse would have something completely different. She could have whatever she liked. And friends came over. I'd just say, go down to the cellar, grab whatever you want. Uh, however many bottles you want, let's just taste through them all. Uh, so it changed my perspective on wine. And and I started giving them away to friends. Um, I knew that they had uh, value in the restaurant because I was frustrated in restaurants. You know, you, you get a great bottle of wine and you want one more glass and you go to there by the glass list. It was normally a pretty steep step down because they were frightened of wastage. Um, but it's, you know, now eight years since launch, we're in 60 countries. We're in probably 10,000 restaurants around the world. And and used by wineries and, and importantly by the, the importers and distributors of fine wine uh, as well, globally. It's uh, been an extraordinary journey as someone who, you know, this is my other job, I <laughs> still work in medicine, uh, but you know, wine's only become more and more important to me. And the people sure. you meet, like, uh, like Daniel, um, and like Game, who I've not met yet, I don't think, <laughs> uh, right? People that work in wine are generally speaking really wonderful people. I certainly think so. I've certainly found that. Um, and over that time, you've also expanded your portfolio and you, you've been busy over the past couple of years while we all have all been quarantining or, you know, trying to get through, um, especially for those hospitality folks. So tell me a little bit about, you know, Corvin's newest additions. Yeah. Um, so we, we've always had the, the timeless version uh, where the, we now call it timeless or classic. Uh, and it, it, uh, it does the same thing that it used to. It, needle goes to the cork, press the trigger, argon goes in, wine comes out, um, and wine lasts for a long time. The only complaint that I had, and I'll pour a little bit here, of this marvelous Pinot Noir from Tuscany, on odd wine I picked up in Milan just recently. Press the trigger, let go, uh, wine comes out. So we've got this new system that's essentially hands-free on the clamp. So instead of the old clamp, you had to pinch and and uh, apply and, and let go and take off. Think about, you just have this one that's automatic. It clamps onto the, the neck of the bottle and- Awesome. Uh, yeah, so super quick. Um, we, I was in Australia where I invent pretty much everything that I do because there's a 24 hour flight back. Um, and uh, this, this guy in a restaurant called the Stunned Mullet, uh, which sounds like a really <laughs> bad hair day. Uh, he, he, um, he had a huge wine list by Coravin and he said, I love Coravin, but uh, it pours too slowly. Uh, it takes too much training. People that don't know how to use it waste gas. Um, I, they, and if they really don't know how to use it, they'll break the needle. Um, I really love the idea of Coravin, but you know, can you make it better? Uh, I don't need wine to last for five years. That was the other important thing that he told me. And so I was like, well, you know, I'll give it a try. And so on the flight back from Australia, I came up with Pivot. So importantly, Pivot removes the stopper. Oh, that was his other complaint. Corbin doesn't work with every closure. Uh, we right. had developed Corbin for screw cap, which solved most of his Australian problems, uh, where you just crack the bottle open and then apply our screw cap and you can use it like a cork. Um, but not Venalock, not plastic cork, not these new biopolymers that we don't work with. And so he said, make it universal. So we've got a stopper, and this sounds kind of antithetical to the whole core of the situation, but first thing you do is you remove the stopper or closure or whatever it is, and you place this stopper inside. This stopper has a little valve that, uh, and a cap. And so the way it works is, and I figured since Gabe was Austria and Germany, I've got to 
I've got a Comptal Riesling uh, Hirsch. So the way it works is you just pop this cap off, place this big tube through, doesn't wear out, really hard to break, tip it sideways, I press the button, argon goes in, you can see how fast it pours. Wow. And it lasts in a couple of seconds. So that's Pivot. That was the first thing we launched into the pandemic. Uh, we had a, I've got a great engineering staff. We were all locked inside as everybody else was. And so uh, they worked really hard to develop a pivot. And you just close that cap and put it back in your fridge or cellar. Um, wine lasts for at least a month. And I bet we're going to be able to get it to go for six months, maybe a year um, after that's awesome. pivoting. Yeah, let's pivot. Yeah, uh, so great for by the glass pourers, I'm, I'm guessing. Super quick and more efficient. Because it uses a big tube, it pours more wine per capsule. Mm -hmm. So 20 glasses per capsule, even without training. Um, so you don't have to learn how to use it, which is great. Uh, but then we also thought um, one of the big complaints was we run out of gas too fast. And so uh, for the trade, that's really important because you guys are pouring a ton of glasses. So we came up with the pro system. The pro system, we talked to our capsule manufacturer and they made a longer capsule that we can sell for the same price to the trade as our smaller one. And so 30% more gas, which means 25 glasses with the pivot and 20 glasses with the standard Coravin. And it's a capsule that just drops in to a normal Coravin. You'll notice this capsule cup is a little bit longer than our standard system. Actually, these are both pro, oh no, there we go. So one's 30% longer than the other. So this is our Model 3 Pro. It's got a longer capsule cup that takes this uh, new capsule that has more gas. That's just like the old system. Thread it on and you're ready to go and you pour more glasses for, for each capsule. So that's something that's exclusively available to the trade uh, through our website or through our distributors. It works. We have both a Pivot Pro system and a Corvin Timeless Pro system. So uh, just need a longer capsule cup and you get more gas. That's great to know um, that, you know, you're able to get more gas, more pours for the same price you said. Yes. That's it. Yeah. That's we're, trying to get, we're trying to get our mantra at, at Corbin is to try to get the cost of pre preservation of any bottle down to under a dollar per, per bottle, whatever it is. Uh, that's our goal. And as we, as we start to buy, uh, larger and larger quantities of capsules. We have a little bit more negotiating power with our marvelous provider of a excellent, I have to admit, uh, impossible to find another producer who makes as high quality capsules as our guy does. But, you know, if we're buying them by the million, they they tend to come a little cheaper than if we buy them by the hundred thousand. <laughs> that quantity discount, which I'm sure everyone is uh, familiar with if they're, if they're buying wine as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, One tell us things, about the newest in the newest addition to the oh, yeah. fam. Super, super wonderful thing. Uh, I'm excited to totally, see this in action. It's, you, it's changed my life as much as Corbin changed the way that I was drinking still wine. Um, Corbin sparkling is really, like, I opened, I was a terrible sparkling wine drinker. I drank it, you know, once or twice a year. Um, on a birthday or when somebody took me to the old uh, Riddler in New York, um, that's when I would drink sparkling wine. But um, I, there's such a commitment to a bottle of sparkling. It goes flat and it oxidizes. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't, didn't open it, didn't explore it the same way I was exploring still wine. Um, now that has changed. So I worked for four years doing it the wrong way. Um, I was trying to not remove the, the cork I had a patent on a needle that came in at an angle and the oh, wine wow. goes, oh, it was a mess. The it sounds like goes, a mess. <laughs> yeah, the wine would go through the needle, so I had a valve and then repressurize it because it would expand in the container that was outside. It was just a, <laughs> it was a, a terrible, terrible uh, path to go down. And um, one of my engineers, four years into that path, said, stop. Uh, carbon dioxide protects the wine from oxidation on its own. Carbon dioxide is even heavier than argon. We don't need to necessarily protect during the pouring process. We just need to seal the bottle so that no air gets in, no oxygen in particular, and no CO2 gets out. And then we need, which sounded really simple, and then we need to be able to restore and protect the collage. 
So uh, it took us four years and uh, the pandemic really accelerated absolutely everything. Big problem was fitting on every bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Krug's got their narrow neck. Um, uh, who else is out there? Baresh has a strange neck due to the way that they they uh, they ferment their wines. Um, Gosset had a has this huge flange. Uh, when I, when I talked to them about it, I was like, "You're causing us to redesign the entire stopper." And, <laughs> and they they said to me, "You know, well, we sort of settled on this bottle in the 1700s. We're not going to change. So it'd be really nice if you made it work." So uh, this is truly a universal stopper. It fits on absolutely any bottle of sparkling wine from a half bottle to a magnum. Um, if you find a bottle it does not fit on, send me a photograph uh, at greg at .com. I will send you a case of that wine. Uh, <laughs> we, we it's a challenge. To, it's a challenge, <laughs> exactly. I just, I just feel like I lost a lot of money on some esoteric research, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, we always want it to be, to be the best. Um, so it's, it's a universal stopper. We, one other thing that we discovered in developing Pivot, in the Pivot Stopper, this is how we're gonna get the pivoted wines the last few year, is that uh, not all the materials that you could use for a stopper are the same. Uh, turns out that silicon rubber, which is used by the almost, almost the entire industry to stop the bottles, is one of the most transparent to oxygen in existence. Hmm. In fact, if you look for oxygen permeable elastomer on Google, you will find silicon rubber. It is the most oxygen permeable. So uh, we found that out when we couldn't get sparkling wines to last very long. So we switched materials. Uh, luckily I work in medicine and there are some pretty esoteric materials that are elastic, food safe, and don't allow any oxygen or CO2 through. So that's one of the ways that we get out now over a month. We're up to a month in our claims, but. I'm, uh, I'm finding I'm going out further. This one's only October 17th, so not that one. So the way, and then let's see, the other thing that's cool about it is uh, the way that it opens. So this is a little handle that would pop open. Uh, that would release all the gas very quickly and uh, make a popping sound, which is not great for the restaurant. So we also made a way that you can release the gas slower and quieter just by tilting. Good to know that uh, there's still gas inside from a couple of weeks ago. So you tilt this and advance, then pop up this handle. This is a safety position so that if somebody didn't release the pressure and opened it, it would still stay on the bottom. It would bottom. go off, yeah. yeah. And then that's all the way open. Take it. This is a marvelous bottle of Brundlmeier Brut. I'm an Austrian fan. So this is giving out. us a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, it's the, exactly. This is, a, this is two weeks out, so it's not much of a test for us anymore. But uh, so that, that's it. You open, pour, and then close like so. And that's, that's resealed. So in between pours of the restaurant, that's all you need to do. Uh, at the end of service, or for me at home, when you're done, we've got a charger that restores the CO2. So uh, we use pure CO2 gas in a capsule that is the same size and shape as our Pro, except a different top so that you don't mix it up. One will mm -hmm. fit into the other. Uh, this will pressurize and preserve up to seven bottles of, of, um, of standard bottles of sparkling water. So it winds up being about a buck a bottle for sparkling as well. And then it's got this green indicator. That green indicator is set at a pressure that perfectly protects the prelage of sparkling wines that are low pressure, like Prosecco, mm -hmm. and really high pressure like uh, Chandon from California, highest pressure wine we ever found. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and champagnes in between, normally toward the high end, but they can be quite variable too. Anybody who likes Solos, you know that's true. Uh, they, they can be kind of low. So uh, place on top of this, and I'll push down, you'll notice that green indicator goes red, and then when it's fully pressurized, it goes back to green again. That's it. Easy enough, how fun. Yeah, yeah, we've been waiting fun. to see it in action. So exciting! It's uh, it's so simple. It's kind of silly, uh, but it works extremely well. We just did wine tastings in New York and Napa and all over Europe. Um, we're now the official sparkling wine preservation system for Moet Hennessy brands. So they tested it at Krug and Chandon, and uh, where else? I was just 
And Ruinar uh, tested it, did, did their own blind tasting. Peter Lean posted on it. I was very excited, it scared the crap out of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it really works. Um, you can have a glass of sparkling today and come back a month later and drink that bottle. It should be the same as one that was just open. Uh, or you can have half a bottle or two thirds. Um, and it's, I gotta tell you, it changed my sparkling wine consumption. I drink at least one glass of sparkling wine pretty much every day. And uh, I've got six or seven different sparkling wines in that Eurocop back there. And I kind of rotate through. Uh, it's now like a third of the wine that I drink. That's so fun. I was joking that I rarely, you know, my, my husband and I, we rarely drink less than a bottle of, of sparkling wine, but now we can do a flight just at yeah. home on a Tuesday. So that's exciting. Congratulations on the launch. Um, and, you know, now kind of talk, having talked about the Corvin portfolio a bit, I'd love to dive more into the application of these devices in restaurants, in wholesale um, for our, you know, beverage professionals who are tuning in. Um, so, Daniel, I'd love to throw it over to you to, to talk a little bit about using Corvin for on-premise. How have you used Corvin for your beverage programs and what have been the impacts uh, on your programs and, you know, their profitability? Oh, hi. Thanks for having me. And Greg, great to see you again. Great to see you. I think I saw you a couple of weeks ago with the launch of the uh, Sparkling at Le Pavillon. That was uh, quite a day. Um, great one. You know, it, it's funny because I sat down with Greg with the prototype of that in my office. Uh, I think, I'm sure several people had seen it, but I was one of the early people to see it. And um, all I could think of was with Greg is, you know, sometimes you meet somebody who's a self-proclaimed mad scientist and you don't know what's going to happen and you can't, can't, kind of can't wait to get out of the conversation. <laughs> but, but with Greg it's happened again and again where he's proved that his mad scientific mind uh, brings fantasy to reality. So uh, it, it, it's really, I want to congratulate you once again, Greg. It's, it's, Thank you. it's amazing. Thanks for um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a little, I'm, I'm actually a little annoyed right now because I'm up in the country and last night I used the pivot on uh, a delicious Beaujolais. I'm up here all alone. So I was just gonna have a glass or two and I ran out of gas. I didn't bring up a supply. <laughs> So I, here I am. What am I going to drink next? So I had a beer. I had a beer. So that wasn't so bad. Anyhow, um, you know, it really has changed the beverage industry, this Coravin, um, on many, many levels. Um, at home, as I just described with uh, the pivot that I love to use at home, um, uh, as well as some of the others. But uh, in the restaurant, when I travel to France or elsewhere and I taste with winemakers, so many of them are using the Corvin now to preserve the wine so they don't have to open a bottle for a tasting then, and then wait. But on the restaurant side, you know, it, it, it's very personal. There, there are two things that are extremely, extremely important to me when I dine out and what I look for in a by the glass program. One is the temperature of the wine whether it be white or red, often the whites are served too cold and the reds are served too warm. And I've made a scene many, many times by asking them to get me an ice bucket for the red wine and embarrasses my wife and everybody I'm with. So I've developed a technique that I'll share with you sometime, Greg, um, to solve that problem. But temperature is just one of my pet peeves um, that, uh, you know, it's gotta be the right temperature. And the other thing is when I have a wine by the glass, um, I often have found myself saying, well, when was this bottle open? Because, I, I, you know, the most popular varieties served in restaurants are Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, maybe Cabernet, Merlot. But, but uh, often if I want a Mencia from Spain, I'm going to say, when did you open that bottle? Because it could have been weeks before somebody else ordered it. So um, they, you've solved that problem. Uh, right now, we use the Corvin system, different systems at uh, Danielle's restaurants, at all the restaurants. We've just uh, adapted the uh, sparkling to the pavillon because we have, well, we have one of the greatest uh, champagne lists in the country. Um, Gabe, you've been very helpful in uh, facilitating that, but uh, we have a tremendous selection of sparkling wine, of champagne especially. And so now we're going to be able to really put flights together and, and serve it in, you know, different methods. 
Um, but beyond that, beyond the sparkling, just being able to serve wine by the glass, which is such a popular category for people. Uh, at Bar Blue, for example, right across from uh, Lincoln Center, people often want a glass of wine and they then go to a show. So rather than just serve two or three or five glasses uh, by the glass, we can expand it to 20 without any fear. And just to, to go back a little bit, um, I had a, a bottle of the Dom Perignon that we had at the uh, launch the other day. Uh, what was that, two weeks ago we had that launch? And the DP had already been open for a couple of weeks, Wait. I believe. Yeah, so you're and on the I had it, um, it two days ago, and it's still brilliant fresh, okay? So you have five, six weeks of a, a great champagne that you can serve and, and drink with great confidence. Um, <clears throat> another example is a... Uh, a burgundy that I brought over for one of my events, La Polay. And um, for some reason, the winemaker wasn't able to make it that year. So we just held on to the bottles. And then she said to us, said, you know, I corvin those bottles to make sure that they'd be in good condition for the event. So she corvin them about a month, maybe two months before shipping them. And then we had to postpone the event and we didn't do the event for six years. So I had all these bottles of a very fine Von Romanet Petit Mont for six years, going back to 1990. And I was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with these bottles if they're no good? And how are we gonna sell? You know, I really roll dice sometimes. I should, uh, you know, I should have been a gambler, which, I, I, which I'm not. But I said, I'm gonna serve these bottles. I'm gonna sell the dinner on the basis of the appellation and the producer and the vintage. And it was a very expensive dinner. And sure enough, every single bottle was pristine. Six years. So thank you for that. <laughs> I don't advise doing that. But, um, but I'll tell you, you know, I did, I did a little, uh, just a little sample mathematical equation to answer your question about profitability and how the Corbin helps. And this is a true story. Let's just take an example of a bottle of wine that costs $20. A bottle costs $20. There are 24 ounces of wine in the bottle. So the $20 bottle, that's 83 cents per ounce. And this is, this is a true story. So in one week, in one week period recently, we sold 886 glasses of wine by the glass. That's 147 bottles, okay? The wow. revenue on those wines by the glass was $18,227. Now those 886 glasses each had four ounces of wine in it. That equals 3,544 ounces of wine. You can test this. I'll show you the equation later. But I didn't make a mistake. I'm not making a mistake. <laughs> Each ounce of wine represented $5.14 in revenue. $5.14 in revenue for each ounce. Now, if the bottles were not managed well, and this always happens. At the end of a shift, the end of a night, you have a little wine left in the, in the bottle. And if let's just say two ounces were left in the bottles and they weren't corvined and they were unable to be corvined at the end of the night, they probably wouldn't be serviceable the next day because they'd be oxidized. So you would lose those two, two ounces. So follow me here. Two ounces lost on those 147 bottles of wine equals 294 ounces times $5.14 per ounce of lost revenue. That equals $1,511 of unrealized revenue for the week times 52 weeks equals $78,572. That's a salary. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, it's incredible. So by being able to carve in those bottles of wine, you're preserving the little bit that's remaining in the bottle and you're going to use it the next night rather than dump it down the drain or have the bartender drink it. <laughs> so. It is revolutionized and made much more profitable our by the glass program. Um, and it's also much, much even more than that has made us uh, an attractive wine destination because we can offer so many wines by the glass. And something that I always have to remind uh, the chef, I mean, I don't really have to remind him because Danielle loves wine and he understands the importance of the wine program in the restaurants. But chefs do need to be reminded how important the wine program is in a restaurant because 
the dining public has evolved over the last, I don't know, let's say 10 years, 10, 15, 20 years. When I started in the industry, people would sit down and have a, a martini to start the meal. And then they'd have two. And then maybe they'd have a bottle of wine. But now people will, will have a glass of wine to start the meal. And not just any glass of wine. The dining public is so much more sophisticated today than it was uh, 10 years ago that they're willing to try, uh, whether it be an orange wine, a mencia that I, I mentioned earlier, a Riesling. So by being able to expand your selection of wines, you're expanding your selection of styles, your price points, and you're giving people an experience because more than anything today with the competition in the restaurant industry, the wine component can enhance an experience to the point where they say, wow, the food was really good, but we had so much fun and we learned so much and let's go back there and let's bring our friends there. So rather than just offering four or five glasses of wine by the glass, just kind of by automatically say, well, we have a Chardonnay, a Pinot Noir and a Merlot. Um, and then, you know, they get a good roast chicken. That's perfectly acceptable. But um, I always felt that and this is where I get into fights with chefs, but I always felt that the role of the sommelier in the front of the house is as important as the quality of the food on the plate, because we do create an experience one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, exchange of ideas, communication. So um, I think that Greg has facilitated that for us wine professionals. I'm no longer a sommelier. I love hopping on the floor once in a while, but um, you know, that was a, that was a, a treat that I had uh, for many years, about 30 years ago. <laughs> um, but, but in training, this is, this is what I, I like to tell people, engage people. And you can also pour just the taste. Here, try this recently that you've never heard of before, or try this, or try that, or try that. And you're not losing anything. So sure. that's my take on it. Thanks so much for sharing that. And, you know, Greg, I knew you were the physics guy, but I didn't realize that we had the math guy here too, you know? <laughs> so I guess me, any dev instructor is a math guy. I've been guy. working on that all morning, so. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing that, like, real-world example with us. Um, you know, Greg, I know you've seen a lot of different uh, restaurant programs use Corbin in various and creative ways. Um, can you share with us any other ways that you've seen Corbin, you know, really enhance beverage programs? Yeah, I mean, uh, luckily we're in these 60 different countries and there's some cities that are real standouts, London being one, Hong Kong being another, New York, um, San Francisco. And so I've gotten to see, uh, and Australia actually, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, super creative with their Corbin programs. Uh, so the, the basic Corvin program would be, say the restaurant has five whites and five reds that are normal by the glass list. Um, they'll have a sommelier selection or a Corvin selection of, of um, higher uh, price point wines uh, or a greater variety like, like Daniel was talking about, Menthea or, or some other grape variety that people don't really know, but the sommelier says, hey, you really need to try this. And so they'll have a Corvin by the glass program on higher higher price point, which they're worried, they certainly don't want to waste, and they're worried it, it may not move. Um, and so those will be like five whites, five reds, and a couple of dessert wines as well. So this is also used on vintage port and Sauternes. Seen a lot of Sauterne poured through. Uh, and sometimes people will do mini pairings, like one dish with three glasses of wine. So I saw a dessert plate uh, oh. in New York. It was a plate of cheese and three decades of Chateau Yquem. Wow. You know, three different decades. And they sold it for a hundred and something dollars. But, you know, you're getting three different decades of Chateau Yquem cheese. Pretty amazing. As DJ was saying, unforgettable experience. I still remember that restaurant. I remember being there. Um, some of the others are, are Corbin boards. So um, uh, in, in London in particular, there's a place called Noble Rot, which if anybody goes to London, please go to Noble Rot. A uh, spectacular wine-focused restaurant with also very good food. But they'll have a Corbin board. And, uh, and it'll just be... 15 or 20 different wines that they've got by the glass. They've got some amazing sommelier there who always select some pretty cool vintage stuff. Um, and I, I asked them how it affected, there's a master of wine who runs the, runs the place, asked them how it affected their, their revenue and their profit. He goes, uh, Corbin is 15% of the wine we sell, just in terms of volume, mm -hmm. but it's 25% of our profit. Wow. Because, because they're higher price point. 
He's like, what matters is not percentage margin, it's dollar margin. Uh, you know, 15% of a $100 bottle is a lot more than 15% of a $20 bottle. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't really care about the percentage margin, you care about the dollar margin on the glass. And so he creates great experiences every day, has this rotating Corbin board, uh, everyone's confident that it's fresh and uh, they get super creative on the wines that are on there. The other one that I saw in San Francisco at an Italian restaurant that then made its way over into Australia, and I see a lot of it in Australia, is a way of using Corbin that I didn't expect. It's you look at, you open up the wine list and there's no by the glass. It's all half bottle or full bottle. And you see like 120 positions, half bottle and full bottle. And you're like, where'd you get all these half bottles? And so they use Coravin in a fast flow needle. We have, we have different needle designs. They use the fast flow, which is a bigger needle, pours quicker. Uh, they use that to pour the first half of the bottle when they sold that. And then when they sell the second half, they pull the cork and serve the rest of it. So it's super fast, it's really efficient. Um, and it creates this remarkable list. I, I asked the guy like, what's the thought here? And he goes, well, there's always two people. And so they want to, they'll split one half of one bottle and one half of another bottle. Instead of having one bottle, they have twice the choices. So it was a, a cool thought. Um, and then there's the crazy places like, um, like 67 Paul Mall in London, which is a wine focused club that has between 800 and 1,000 wines by the glass, basically everything. Um, and then the same is true in a wonderful place in Oslo, Norway called Territoriet. Um, and she's just a genius. And she has 150, 200 different wines, many of them out of Magnum. Uh, and she serves them all by court, by the glass. She's a by the glass restaurant. And now That's she's moving to sparkling wine. Yeah. I can't wait to see what people are going to, actually the, in Paris, where we launched Corbin first, um, I think, uh, I saw the first restaurants picking it up and doing uh, champagne pairings. So they, they had, you know, six different courses in this Michelin star restaurant, they had a different champ sparkling wine for every course. Which Greg, so I have fun. a question for you. Yeah. The restaurant in Spain that does the half bottles and full bottles, they pour that first half bottle into a neutral bottle? They poured it into a decanter. Oh, so they, they had a marked decanter that, that identified half a bottle. And then what they would do is actually leave the bottle on the table. Because everyone likes to take a photograph of it. So they'd sell half, put it on the table, unless somebody else ordered it. <laughs> they, they would, had to steal it. <laughs> yeah, they would grab it or they would pour from a different bottle so yeah they they always had one bottle pour of, them, of any wine uh they would mark it by cutting the foil at the top so that when they put it back in the rack they could see that that's the one that's uh already half gone it was a genius strategy i loved it and now they use pivot very cool and I think Daniel, you had you know mentioned we were chatting earlier that you know amidst all of these still mid-pandemic impacts, you know people are kind of carrying a smaller inventory, but they still want to have a robust a robust by the glass program. Um, and I would assume that Corvin can kind of help with this, being able to get by on on lower inventory without having to buy you know uh, limit your by the glass selections at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to uh, dwell on the, sort of the, you know, the negative impact of, uh, of the pandemic, but, uh, but, but it's true. People have to manage their inventories and be careful about their purchases because of cash flow and, and so on. And unfortunately, a number of restaurants closed. Um, but, um, but it's true. I mean, you can have the appearance of having a very robust wine program without increasing your, your inventory dramatically. And... Uh, you know, it's all coming back. It's all coming back. And it's uh, the, this restaurant scene, as Gabe could attest to, is extremely strong in New York. But, uh, but we've all, I hate to use the word pivot, but we've all kind of evolved, you know, and uh, thought of creative ways to really enhance what we're doing. And uh, that's certainly one of the tools that enabled us to do that is Corbin. Absolutely. Well, now, you know, looking over more towards the wholesale, the sales rep side of things, Gabe, we've been talking all your favorite things, Austrian wine, champagne, um, all in your wheelhouse. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you've seen kind of the role of the sales rep change? Again, not to dwell on, you know, the negative things that have happened over the past 18 months, but kind of the new reality that we're operating in now. Sure. Well, I... Uh... 
Thank you very much for having me. And uh, Greg, I think we met when you came a long time ago to our offices and presented uh, Corvin to our entire staff. Um, we kind of made an investment in uh, in buying Corvins for everybody, every salesperson, um, as well as every team of brand managers that we have at Skernick from kind of pretty early on. So we've been using uh, Corvin for a long time. And, you know, kind of immediately, at least kind of, you know, we can talk about how it's changed things uh, here, you know, currently a little bit, but um, it kind of, it really changed the game for us overnight because we didn't have to make these decisions about whether or not it made sense uh, from a, you know, profitability standpoint to open up a very expensive bottle of wine. Uh, in fact, we have a big, a big cob now in our, uh, you know, when we first uh, brought on Corvin, we were still out in uh, Long Island in our Syosset office, but now we're in Manhattan and we have a, a section of, of our cob that's completely devoted to Open, uh, open bottles, already access bottles uh, from Corvin. And so, um, you know, whereas before we would kind of have to weigh whether it made sense to open uh, a very expensive bottle of uh, Austrian wine or very expensive German wine, um, you know, we, we no longer had to do that calculation. Um, and, you know, it just, it was something that, you know, some customers hadn't seen before and those who had recognized the value from, uh, from our side also, it meant that we're able to open up a much larger array of wines regularly um, you know, they're giving the sales, the, our sales team uh, access to those wines or just taking them out into the market ourselves. I mean, it's something that I continue to do today. Some of the wines that uh, I work with, unfortunately, uh, on one hand, um, they're not quite as popular as some of the other, uh, the other categories of wine, um, but they're extraordinarily delicious. And uh, if you can get those wines in front of people, even in the kind of mid-tier and higher, uh, higher price point, um, I think that it really opens people's eyes to the kind of possibility that some of these wines represent. You can re remember uh, bringing out a, a 2002 Vinotech from Nikolaihoff, which is a, a wine that's held for 17 years uh, in cask and bringing it out with a Corvin, having uh, Thomas, who was at the Nomad at the time, uh, say that was super delicious wine. And uh, he ended up putting it on his own Corvin, uh, you know, reserve list and was able to use that as, as pairings. I think that there's Huge opportunity, I think, uh, Courtney, what you mentioned earlier about, you know, kind of control of inventory um, is, is really important, I think, on the restaurant side, but also um, on the distribution side. Um, you know, we're not, uh, especially kind of mid-pandemic, we're not bringing in enormous amounts of the highest end wines. You know, we saw people kind of moving more towards value-driven selections. And so, um, you know, this is, uh, they're not wines that we have in huge quantities. So, Every sample that gets pulled, uh, it matters more from a percentage standpoint um, when you're when you're talking about a uh, total number of bottles. So I think that that's something certainly that uh, we're looking at. Um, I was really happy to see the the sparkling wine, uh, the sparkling system, and how that works. I'm really excited to get my hands on that because this is something. There's a problem. It you know kind of just like the the Coravin uh, previously solved a problem that we were looking at. I mean, for selling champagne for a big part of uh, my job. This has been a constant problem, you know. The if you're a uh, you know a wine director and you're tasting champagne with me or with any other uh, salesperson or or portfolio manager, you know, generally speaking, if you know that you're going to be tasting champagne, you want to book the earliest appointment. That's when the wine is the perfect temperature and it has the most kind of effervescence that's closest to what it should taste like. Um, I can remember, you know, running around the city during this time of year in other years. Uh, when you know we have to stash bottles at an account or at the office to kind of go back mid midway through the day and pull fresh samples again because the wines get tired after you know sitting in a wine bag getting jostled around and and honestly uh, part of the issue the biggest issue is the closure um, the those kind of plastic drop arm closures that we've been using for lo so long they really don't last very long and they're not they're not very efficient uh, in terms of keeping keeping the bubbles in the bottle which is where we want to want to keep them so. This is, I think, this next step, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of uh, solving a problem that we've been looking at for a long time. And I can imagine all of the different uh, scenarios in which uh, this will be useful for me, but also on the restaurant side. Um, I was at a, a restaurant not too long ago where the food was really uh, exciting and different. And <clears throat> it was a tasting menu, a number of different courses, and uh, would have liked to have sparkling wines at different points in the meal. Maybe not a full glass, but a partial glass. And this is like, you know, the perfect application uh, for this. So both as somebody who sells wine for a living, but also as a diner, I think that this is a really exciting, uh, you know, new, new invention. So thank you, Greg.
Yeah, let's make that sparkling mid course kind of a, a thing now to brighten things up. <laughs> oh, it's a, one of the things that I have seen uh, was uh, there's so much physics involved with wine, but particularly with sparkling wine, it's still really important to keep the bottle cold. And that's uh, something that I've learned uh, that the, the ability of a sparkling fluid to hold bubbles is dependent upon its temperature. The colder it is, the more, spark, the more CO2 it can hold. So uh, keep it cold in your bag. Uh, but other than that, it should work out really well. Um, I, I, I have not tested it enough with uh, people like yourself, Gabe, in carrying around samples. And so I look forward to testing it with you again, uh, the, the new system, because it's important to me that it works for everybody. And we, we've really been lucky to interact with so many different parts of the the world of, of fine wine and 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 uh, importers distributors was not something I was aware of. I didn't know how wine got to the store or the restaurant, uh, but now I recognize how important your job is. And actually, the first place most people see Corvin is when their importer or distributor brings the wine by uh, the restaurant. So, uh, got to make sure that you guys are are happy. <laughs> hey, Greg. Ask... Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I want to. Um... Well, I'll put you on the spot. Well, maybe I'm not putting you on the spot. It's more of a challenge. Let's, let's look at it that way. Um, you know, as somebody who has to look at the um, the size of the pour and uh, maximizing the, uh, you know, getting the most out of, we, out of the bottle that we can, um, are you going to be working on a device that will be adjustable to say, oh, this is going to be a two ounce pour, two and a half ounce, three ounce. So you don't just leave it to the human eye to say, okay, that's enough. That's the pour. It's, it, is a, it is a remarkable challenge uh, to <laughs> achieve that, um, it, in part because of the nature of regulations, um, the, but it is absolutely something that we are thinking hard about. Uh, the European Union is probably the toughest in terms of when you say 150 milliliters, you mean not 149, right? uh -huh. you mean 150. And so uh, it, it's, I wish, I wish it was, there was just pr truth in advertising. We could say 150 plus or minus four, right? Because uh, we could get really close. Um, but it is something that I, I am working on. I would love to, I mean, if there's anything that we can do to extend the, the life of a wine so you can drink, serve, and sell it whenever you want, we're going to do that. Uh, if there's anything we can do to make it faster, easier, and more fun, we're going to do that. And now we're beginning to segment our product line by the consumer in the trade. And, and when we do that, and the consumer is less interested in 150 or 175 or 125, although you know, we, we do have the Model 11, and I, I heard just recently somebody likes it. It gets close to measuring, but it doesn't quite uh, measure. You can set to a taste or a glass, and you can control uh, to some extent the, the volume of that pour by the speed of pour on an app. So it gets close. I've got this little slider and I can slide it up and down, um, but it's not European compliant in terms of, you know, we couldn't put ounces on it, um, which, which I would love to be able to do for the trade because every ounce is your money, uh, right? It's, it's your revenue and it's your profit um, and heavy pours. Uh, are, are tough for the restaurant and great for the customer and light pours are bad for the customer and great for the restaurant. So if we could make it so that we could have an indicator on it, we've, we've thought really hard about it and working on it. Working I, on it. And more, then, innovation, more of an innovation ahead, I would yeah. guess, for Corbin. Well, you know, Gabe, going back to kind of what you said about the value of being able to bring out, you know, these high revenue dollar um, wines and show them to, to buyers without having to worry about, is this going to get wasted? Can I find other people to, um, you know, taste this wine as well? Um, I'm sure that it's also helpful when you use Coravin in that to be able to give um, some of these buyers ideas for how they can also sell these wines and not have them languish on a wine list as well. Um, and Greg, you had kind of said that, when in the early days of wholesalers using Coravin, it was really them that kind of helped you introduce Coravin to more buyers as well. Yeah, both good and bad. I mean, there, there are some tricks to using Coravin so that the wine lasts the longest. And, um, and you never want to serve a bad wine to somebody uh, as a demonstration of the product. So 
to all of those watching out there, three really critical steps to getting the best out of your Corbin. Somebody asked horizontal storage or vertical storage. It doesn't make a big difference, but horizontal is good. Uh, DJ, man, take care. Good luck. May all go well. Daniel, thank so, you so uh, much for joining us. Daniel has to leave early, uh, sure but amazing. we really appreciate it. So uh, three things, clean, clear, and cellar um, to get the best out of your wine. Clean, hot water through here at the end of the night uh, if you've used your Coravin. Just hot water through the spout. You don't have to take it apart. Um, it's just that Britannomyces, Saccharomyces, Acetobacter can grow out on the inside of the needle, especially if you pour Chateau Mouchard and you really like it like I do, and then you go to another wine like White Burgundy. You really don't want Brett in White Burgundy, so... Uh, a uh, little hot water through here. If you feel guilty because you've used your Corbin forever and never washed it, uh, you should feel guilty, but then pour cheap vodka down here. Um, it'll kill everything on the inside and then you can use water afterwards. So clean, clear is what I do. So if I've just poured a glass of uh, red and now I wanna pour a glass of white, just before I pour that glass, I press the trigger before putting the needle through. And that clears this needle of any remaining wine that's on the inside, uh, just before you access. I see a lot of people who push the needle through and then press the trigger. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, what you're doing is you are injecting that wine that's still in the needle into your bottle. Uh, you don't wanna do that. Um, and Homemade so, rosé. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. A little bit of rosé and a lot of Britannomyces if you're, if you're expecting. Um, and trust me, Brett loves white burgundy. I've seen it. Um, and then cellar. Store the wine in the cold, number one, uh, or keep it on side. I don't know why it lasts longer stored on its side. Uh, there's some theories about area of access and keep the cork wet, but it's also true with our synthetic stuff like Pivot. And it's also true with sparkling. I don't know why, uh, but the everything lasts longer if it's stored on its side. Wine seems to care about gravity. I, I don't know why exactly. So clean, clear cellar. Those are the best things you can do. Awesome. That's great to have those pro tips. And, you know, we've gotten uh, one or two questions in our chat. But if you all have any others before we um, hop off, please feel free to ask them. And I'll pose them to our, our panelists here. Um, we had talked a little bit about some of the, uh, you know, the Coravin moments, as I like to call them, when you were able to try something really cool or see how things were preserved. For me, it was one time when I was working as a sommelier and we bought a bottle of Dechem at auction and were afraid that it was fake. Um, so we Coravined it and it was not fake. And that was my first taste of Dechem. So thank you, Corvin, for that. <laughs> That's a um, and favorite. That stuff's great. Yeah, for sure. And Greg, you had mentioned um, that, you know, some of the the restaurant in, in Oslo, Norway, um, 67 Paul Mall, they had hundreds and hundreds of wines by the glass that were Coravin. And when they went back to them after they kind of shut down so quickly, they were in perfect condition. Yeah, we were. It was the largest unplanned Coravin efficacy test of <laughs> all time was the pandemic. So uh, 67 Paul Mall, 800 wines. Um, Territory at probably another 200, uh, probably Noble Rod another 100 and some or 80. And, uh, and then they all shut down during the pandemic. And uh, in the UK, they were shut down for 14, 15 months. And uh, they came back to sample through their wines and 67 Palm also said they lost two bottles out of wow. the 800. So uh, it, it's, you hate to say that it, Corbin's great, <laughs> to protect you from loss during a pandemic. But um, that was truly a, a test of the efficacy. I talked to the woman who runs Territoriate and she said she lost one bottle uh, out of the 150, 200 wines that she had. And she was like psyched. She had an opening party right when everyone came back because she was thinking she would have to write them off. But yeah, that's that was a really, really wonderful. Uh, some other great experiences we've had uh, There's a place a guy named Johan, uh, who runs Petrus, which is in Hong Kong, to the top of the Shangri-La hotels. And uh, he, he has spe specially modified his own Corbin to serve out of nine liter and 12 liter bottles, um, wow. which is crazy to see. And he always has a new nine liter bottle uh, every week. Like, how do you uh, hold that? I don't know. <laughs> two people, two people. One for, it's like a dance. They'll, one of them will tip it over, the other one's Corbin, <laughs> and then they tip it back up. 
the, they also do a first growth flight. So pairing where you get one, one year of the five first growth lines of Bordeaux um, and they'll pour you like half a glass or a full glass of each, which, you know, like Chateau Chem, if you, until you've experienced those wines, you don't have an opinion other than a really expensive. Um, right. And Aegon Muller, for example, I mean, they have really expensive bottles of wine. People don't know uh, if they don't get a chance to try them or Keller, um, you know, it's uh, opening somebody's mind to a new experience through the way you use Coravin to sample somebody on something they wouldn't have otherwise tried. And it's, I think there's a wine bar, George, in, in Orlando. He does verticals um, of amazing wines. He's a very wine focused restaurant and he keeps winning Best Buy Wine by the Glass program in the US. And uh, he, he's super creative as a master sommelier and the, the pairings that he'll put together and the, the ways that he will offers wine verticals of, of one wine, horizontals of a region. Um, so you can really learn. You walk away from that restaurant with an experience and a knowledge and say, yeah, I've tried seven years of, of, uh, of Poggi di Sotto, you know, <laughs> just uh, over, over lunch. It's a pretty crazy thing that he can do. And talk about shaping a memorable experience as well for, you know, making those guests come back. Yeah, I wanted to ask Gabe a quick question. Um, have you ever... Bef- was there, were there wines before Corbin that you would not bring out to one style of restaurant because you thought that they would never buy them? That once you brought it out to them, they did start buying them? Like, does that, does that happen? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it, for me, it was more uh, that you're talking about richness of experience. And I think that that's something that Corbin has really like, it's, it's been able to widen all of our kind of understanding of wine because we can taste wines that we wouldn't normally. And I think, you know, when you're talking about like an Italian restaurant, like Del Posto, you know, when, when that was in, uh, you know, it's basically just, uh, you know, champagne and Italian wine. Um, but every once in a while you'd have, you know, a German wine in your bag from another appointment and you could pour something great and then somebody might, uh, might say, well, that was delicious. I can't put it on my list, but I'll buy a case for myself. You know, uh, that's happened more than once uh, for sure. But I think uh, it's also, you know, it's hard to get excited about wines that you've never had before. Um, even if you know that the wines, you know, should be quote unquote great. So being able to have this experience and be able to share that experience with, you know, people in the restaurant community or people in the retail community who, who hadn't been able to taste, you know, what a really great vintage, uh, you know, Al Slaza could taste like, or, you know, even what some older wines taste like. I think that that's, that's where, you know, I traveled to Europe when it's not a global pandemic. I traveled to uh, Europe quite a lot to, to taste with them. And um, as Daniel was saying, a lot of the wine producers that uh, I work with, are also using Corvin, um, you know, not just for tastings, but also to check in on older bottles. And I think that that's something that's uh, really interesting. We have a, um, it's the 850th anniversary of uh, Schloss Goebbelsberg uh, this year, the 850th uh, vintage. And so um, we were supposed to have uh, Michael Musburger, the director of that estate, come in and do a 40 year vertical tasting of Heiligenstein. Unfortunately, we had to postpone that uh, tasting until uh, until January. It was supposed to be uh, actually uh, just you know, today, um, <laughs> today here in, in New York City. Um, but before he sent all of the samples, he, he, he took about 50% of these wines going back to the, you know, 1971 was the, the, uh, the oldest wine and uh, accessed all of them and, and tasted all of them to just be 100% sure that everything that he was uh, sending over was pristine and perfect and exactly the, the way that he wanted it to be. And he's done this a number of times and knows even uh, older wines with, you know, maybe less than perfect corks, not uh, these kind of longer uh, high grade corks that we're using now, this kind of ND tech and that, that kind of thing. Um, it still really works, especially for if you're talking about a period of, uh, you know, less than a year, this is not going to hurt the wine at all, which is pretty amazing. That's awesome. They produce some incredible wines at Schloss Goldesberg and they're, they're different. He, they're individual. I, I went tasting with him um, when I, I think I sold him the first core of it in, into Austria. Uh, <laughs> marvelous guy and they're they're operating on land that is leased from the catholic church and the the, the history is extraordinary and the just as the wines are in there such a remarkable place it's cool that's a cool story to hear thank you for telling me that i i didn't know whether or not he he, he accepted corbin when i was pitching to him um, <laughs> well there you go yeah, yeah Mickey he's a he's a cool customer but uh he's uh you know yeah he he relies on it it's an, it's an important Thing to be able to access them. I mean, 
Um, I know that you're you're friendly with Andreas Bickoff, who's the MW at the director at Brindlemeyer, and he's uh, you know I know that he's a, a big believer in the system also, and and for some of the same same things, not just accessing current releases, but also checking in on vintages, which you know uh, you don't get to drink every day, even as the director or winemaker of an estate like that. Great. Well, I just wanted to thank you both so much um, for, for being here today. And Greg, thank you again for sharing Corbin with us. Um, we're running a couple of minutes over, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. But thank you to everyone who tuned in today. We know it's a busy time for you. And if you have any more questions about how Corbin can support your beverage program or your beverage sales, please visit trade.coravin.com. And you can find Coravin at Coravin on, I think, all of the social media platforms that are out there, or at least the ones I know about. Um, so thank you again so much for being here today. We will share this recording um, if you want to follow up about everything. And we hope you have a great and hopefully not too stressful OND. Thanks, guys. Thanks gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao.